everybody. In today's lecture, I would like to introduce and discuss partition functions and show you a derivation and an example problem. So in our previous lecture on Boltzmann factors, um, I discussed and derived and did example problems with Boltzmann factors. Remember that Boltzmann factors give the relative probability of energy state at a given temperature. So for example, if you want to know the probability that a particle is in some excited state, say excited state 2, compared to the ground state, which would be the probability of 1, the ratio of the probability of the excited state to the ground state would be equal to e to the minus delta E over kT. Now here delta E is the energy difference in between the ground and the excited state. K is Boltzmann's constant and T is the temperature. Now if you'd like more information on Boltzmann's constant, please watch the other lecture which derives and develops this idea. But for now, I'll proceed as though you remember everything about Boltzmann factors. <laughs> okay, so we're going to start our derivation of the partition function by looking at this equation for the Boltzmann factor a little bit more deeply. So the ratio of the probability of state 2 to state 1 would be e to the minus delta e over kt. Now, delta e is the energy difference between state 2 and state 1, so it would be minus e2 minus e1 divided by kt kt in that exponent, okay? So um, we could write this algebraically as e to the minus e2 over kt divided by e to the minus e1 over kt. Because when you subtract powers, it's the same as dividing them as in this fashion here, okay? So what we can do now is we can cross multiply and we can put everything that uh, is associated with state 2 on one side of the equation and everything that's associated with state 1 on the other side. So doing this cross multiplication, I've got probability of state 2 divided by e to the minus e2 over kt equals the probability of state 1 divided by e to the minus e1 over kt. Now, as you can see, these things are equal. I could set up equalities like this for any states, okay, any states. Now, since this is true and since they're equal, they must be equal to some constant factor, okay? And I'm going to call that constant factor 1 over my partition function, or 1 over z, for reasons that I hope will be clear as the lecture proceeds. So now if I just take, for example, this part of my equation, then I can solve for what the probability of state 1 is, right? I can do a little more cross-multiplication, and I see that the probability of state 1 would be this constant 1 over z times e to the minus e1 over kt. So in other words, it's going to be 1 over my partition function times my Boltzmann factor for that energy state. Now in general, this would be true for any energy state. So I'm going to write this now out as a general form. The probability of state s would be 1 over my partition function times e to the minus e s over kt. And in some books, 1 over kt is written as beta, as it is in Schroeder's text, okay? So now, if we could just find what this partition function is, then we could express not just the ratio of the probabilities, but get the actual probability of any state. And that would be a really powerful thing to do, okay? So let's proceed with that. Let's find our partition function z. What we can do is we can find z by summing up all of the probabilities, okay? Now this is known as the normalization condition. If you sum over all possible states, all the probabilities of all possible states, then that should be 1 or 100% chance. In other words, it's definitely in some state with a 100% probability or 100% chance. So we can say by the normalization condition that 1 is equal to the sum over all states of the probability of that state. Now we have an equation for what the probability of that state is. It's equal to 1 over z times e to the minus e s over kt. Now 1 over z, as we said before, is a constant. It's the same, right? So we can pull that out front of our summation. And then we would have 1 over z times the sum of e to the minus e s over kt. Well, it's a constant here, right? So I can just multiply both sides by z. So that means that I have the equation shown here. My partition function z is just equal to the sum over all states of my Boltzmann factors, e to the minus e s over k t, right? Now let's think about this for just a second. In our previous lecture on Boltzmann factors, we showed 
that at low temperatures, it's very unlikely that you're going to have anything in an excited state. Most things are going to be in the ground state. And so that means that these Boltzmann factors are going to be negligibly, negligibly small for anything other than the ground state. And if we reference the ground state energy as zero, then that means that our sum is just one, right? So at very low temperatures, our, our partition function should be approximately one. And it's going to get larger as the temperature increases as those probabilities and Boltzmann factors go up. Now note that every state in the sum gets a term, not every energy, okay? So this is uh, doesn't count, in other words, the degeneracy for the state. So if multiple states um, have the same energy, you need to sum over all the states, not all the energies. Um, and then that Boltzmann factor ends up in the sum a few times. And we'll show in an example how to deal with that, okay? Now here's another thing, and it's really helpful. Um, there's some discussion in Schroeder's thermal physics text about factoring out that ground state energy um, but it's not explained in much depth, so I'd like to elaborate on that. If you do this, it can actually save you a little bit of work. So, for example, our hydrogen atom ground state has an energy of minus 13.6 eV. If we subtract that off and call that our zero or our reference point, and I'm going to call that E sub zero, okay, then we can refer to all the other excited states uh, by the amount delta E that they are above that ground state, okay? So, for example, you might have minus 13.6 eV plus 10.2 eV for the first excited state of hydrogen, for example, right? Okay, so if I want to write that out in a generic way, then I could say that the probability of state S would be 1 over my partition function times e to the minus e naught plus delta E S over KT, where here e naught is the energy of my ground state and delta E S is the amount of energy that I am above my ground state in state S. And then KT, of course, is Boltzmann's constant times the temperature. Now, since I'm adding in the exponent here, I can also write that as 1 over Z, E to the minus E naught over KT times E to the minus delta ES over KT. Okay? So, now let me show you how that factors out. I could also just add up over all my Boltzmann factors to find my partition function. So, showing here, Z would be equal to the sum over all my Boltzmann factors, and as I've just shown, that could be written as e to the minus e naught over kt times e to the minus delta es over kt, summed over all s. Now this ground state energy exponent thing is going to be the same for all the terms. That's a constant, so I can factor that out and pull it outside of my summation. So that gives me e to the minus e naught over kt times the summation of e to the minus delta es over kt. Now let's look at the probability of a single state s. The probability of state S would be 1 over Z times e to the minus E naught over KT times e to the minus delta ES over KT. If I plug in for Z from what I found on the line above, that's e to the minus E naught over KT times e to the minus delta ES over KT divided by e to the minus E naught over KT times the summation of e to the minus delta ES over KT. Now, as you can see, this um, factor with the minus E naught over KT appears in both the top and the bottom of my fraction, and so it cancels out, okay? And so that's why uh, you can factor out that ground state energy. It's unimportant. And just reference the change in energy from the ground state for any of the states. It saves you a little bit of work, right? So the probability of a state S could be written as E to the minus delta E S over KT times the, or divided by the sum of E to the minus delta E S over KT the partition function. So that's our constant offset. Now it will change your raw value of your partition function, but that's not really what we're after here anyway. What we're after is the probabilities of the states, okay? And so the ground state thing factors out when you do that. Let's think about the probabilities just a little bit more deeply. So here are some plots of the probabilities of the state versus the energy of the state for the three different temperatures. And the three temperatures here go from um, cold to hot, uh, T3 is greater than, T2 is greater than T1, okay? Now the coldest state is T1, and we can see that the probability is much higher for lower energy states, and that makes sense, right? And then as the temperatures go higher, the likelihood of higher energy states relative to the ground states grows. You can see here that 
T1 has the sharp decay, and then as you get to higher energy levels, it's actually the bottom of the curve. So it starts out at the top, it's got more in lower energy states, and then it dips low down, and now when you're here at high energy states, it's the one on the bottom. Now T3, there's an inversion. It's not got as many in the ground state as T1, but as you go out to higher states, it's got more in higher level energy states. Okay, and that makes sense because at hotter temperatures, the probability is that you're going to have more um, of your collection in an excited state, right? You've got more energy for that. So the total area of the curve, though, that has to be 1 as we increase the temperature, and that's where the partition function z comes in. 1 over z decreases the probability of the ground state at the beginning, allowing the area under the curve for higher energy states to be larger, okay? Let's do an example problem. This is problem 9 in chapter 6 of Schroeder's Thermal Physics. Let's, uh, part A here. Let's estimate the partition function for a hydrogen atom at 5800 Kelvin. And um, we're going to do the simple thing and make the ground state energy be zero and shift the other energies accordingly. Now I'm just going to do this using the first five energy levels, and I think it'll be obvious why as you go on. Okay? Now, remember that the energy of a hydrogen atom is minus 13.6 eV divided by n squared. Remember, n here is the energy level, okay? So in hydrogen atom, that starts off at n equal to 1 and goes up in integer steps from there. So for n equal to 1 to n equal to 5, the energies of my states are minus 13.6 eV, minus 3.4 eV, minus 1.5 eV, minus 0.85 eV, and minus 0.54 eV plugging in for 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, respectively. Now, if I take the shift of the energy of the state relative to the ground state, then, of course, my ground state shift is 0, right? It's referencing itself. My first excited state, n equals 2, gives me a shift of 10.2 eV from the ground state, and then going up from there, 12.1 eV, 12.75 eV, and 13.056 eV, respectively, okay? Now, I'm going to plug into the equation here for my Boltzmann factor, so I also need to know kT. And we're going to use the units for the Boltzmann constant that are in eV per Kelvin, because that's a little bit more convenient for this problem, right? So remember that the Boltzmann constant can be written as 8.617 times 10 to the minus 5 eV per Kelvin, all right? So I have negative 8.617 times 10 to the minus 5 eV per Kelvin times 5,800 Kelvin, giving me half an eV. All right, so remember that you have to account for the degeneracy of each state. In other words, you're summing over all your states, E sub S, okay? Now remember that for the hydrogen atom, right, if you have, for example, n equal to 1, then you have n equal to 1, l equal to 0, ml equal to 0, and then you can have an up or a down spin. So you can have two electrons in that ground state. If you keep going with that idea, you get eight electrons in the first excited state and so on and so forth. Remember that the equation for the degeneracy of the energy levels of the hydrogen atom is 2n squared. I cover that in a different lecture, okay? But the degeneracy is 2n squared, okay? So what you do when you're doing your partition function is you take a summation of your Boltzmann factors times the degeneracy for that energy state, right? So here, uh, 2n squared would be 2 for n equal to 1, 8 for n equal to 2, 18 for n equal to 3, 32 and 50 respectively for 4 and 5. So if I multiply that degeneracy times my Boltzmann factor, I get the summation that you see here. 2 times e to the 0, 8 times e to the minus 10.2 over 0 0.5, plus 18 times e to the minus 12.1 over 0 0.5, plus 32 times e to the minus 12.75 over 0 0.5, plus 50 times e to the minus 13.06 over 0 0.5. Now, plugging in and finding what the values of those exponents are, or the exponentials are for each term, I get 2, e to the 0 is 1, plus 8 times 1.38 times 10 to the minus 9, plus 18 times 3.09 times 10 to the minus 11, plus 32 times 8.42 times 10 to the minus 12, plus 50 times 4.57 times 10 to the minus 12. Now, as you can see, this Boltzmann factor gets smaller and smaller as you go up in energy levels, and that makes sense given what we said about this, right? Now, it's an infinite sum, but in re reality, at some point, you do have to truncate it, right? And so you can truncate the sum once the likelihood of the excited state starts to drop by quite a bit. 
If I do the summation over these five terms, though, I end up with something that's slightly more than two, as you can see here, right? And that's because these other terms have very um, low powers, right? 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus 11, 10 to the minus 12. And so they're not going to add much on after that first term, which is 2. So that really dominates, okay? Now, if I were to plot the probabilities um, as you go on, then this is what it would look like. This graph is on a semi-log scale, so you can see the values for the excited states are non-zero. And to calculate the probabilities, I just multiply the degeneracy times this factor here. Okay, so this is what I've got. Okay, so um, I hope that little example um, is helpful to you. Okay, so that you can see how to calculate a partition function, and of course what a partition function is, and then how once you have the partition function, you can get the probabilities. Okay, and uh, as always, let me know if you have any questions, and I'll see you in class.